when you look at some of the vaccine trials that we've seen, how are the antibodies and the antibody testing actually developing? Can they be used to make sure that we have a safer vaccine? Yeah, so things are progressing um, at a very nice pace when it comes to some of the vaccine trials. Studies are moving forward into their second phase, which is oftentimes the phase that we really start to get signs of whether vaccines have the potential to be efficacious or, or, or work well in the population. I think in addition to that, there have been a few studies that have started using just antibodies as a therapy. So vaccines induce antibodies. Um, some companies have actually jumped to the fact of giving people those antibodies directly in terms of, uh, uh, of a treatment. And those studies are also moving forward. Um, and have shown some good promise initially. So um, from the side of your immune response, um, there have been, there's been continued good progress uh, towards, towards uh, seeing whether or not we have some good uh, future treatments for this. Are we loosening public health restrictions in a good way? Are we able to contact trace people that may fall ill again to make sure that it's contained? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, uh, there are mixed results, um, I would say, when you look across particularly the United States. There are some states that are doing a good job in terms of keeping cases uh, level um, while they're loosening restrictions. Uh, there are a few states where you're starting to see little upticks in terms of the numbers of cases that are there. Um, everything comes down to being um, good about identifying cases and then being able to track those cases so that the people who are uh, coming in contact with those individuals uh, can be identified and isolated. That's the phase that we're moving into now as we try to expand our economy, um, loosen public health restrictions, but still keep the virus down. So states are going to have to be very, very um, proactive, monitor how they're doing in that, and really work towards um, optimizing those contact uh, identification, testing, and contact tracing strategies uh, for these rollouts to be uh, uh, able to be sustained. Will contact tracing really work? Is there a better way that, than just, you know, simply reopening the economy and, and actually seeing the number of, of deaths to try and track where it is? Yeah, you know, we're going to have to really change the way that we're uh, approaching um, our our day in day out life, the social distancing, mask wearing, uh, various other things in terms of limiting uh, crowds and places. These are going to be the things that we're going to have to deal with for the next, you know, at, at, at least six months to if not a year or more um, to make sure that we're keeping this virus down and not seeing the surge of cases that so many parts of the country saw, um, you know, this spring uh, when the virus first made its way across the United States. Um, Andrew, what do we know about antibodies? So are antibodies, you know, something that actually protects you against being reinfected? Or for the moment, do these tests only prove that you've had COVID-19? Yeah, so um, it, it, another great question. There's two parts to this. We're learning more and more about the antibody responses that are being induced by infection. And there's some good results coming from that, showing that people are generating what we believe are protective responses after infection. Now, the important thing to note, though, is that the tests um, are a bit more limited in what they tell you. Uh, the tests can tell you if you've been infected, um, but they can't tell you if they have these protective antibody levels, at least not the tests that are around right now. So one has to be very careful about the antibody testing, uh, which, of course, is increasing across the country as it becomes more available. It tells you if you've been exposed, but it doesn't necessarily tell you at this point in time whether you're protected from reinfection. So does it make sense to, to you know, get tested one time, but then also wait for more sophisticated antibody testing? Will, will these come out to actually be able to tell you if you're protected from the virus and for how long? Yeah, I think there will be, there is a, there is a hope that once we really identify what arm of the antibody responses are, are providing the protection to people, that the tests can then be fine-tuned uh, so that we're asked, answering both of those questions. Have you been exposed and are you protected at the same time? Uh, it's going to take a little bit of time for us to, to, to come up with those tests simply because uh, we have to wait and make sure that the people who've been infected have these immune responses for longer periods of time. Some things can be moved forward quickly. Um, we have to, other things such as understanding if you're still protected from infection six months after 
uh, you've been infected um, just takes time, uh, which is kind of the obvious thing there, but it really does take some time for us to really understand the full length of protection that's induced by infection. And how much do we understand about certain communities, you know, and also certain countries um, have been affected more than others? Is it just the spreading of the virus and some of the social distancing put in place, or is there a, a much deeper and concerning uh, response that could be linked to genetics? So um, those are the studies that are still uh, in place. Right now we've got population studies going on. Uh, we certainly know that there are uh, parts of the population that seem to be more susceptible to, to severe disease. Um, separating out socioeconomic factors from genetic factors is something that is um, a really a high priority level. Um, we've had a lot of unrest this week in terms of racial tensions, and certainly one of the things that we've noticed in the U.S. is that um, minority populations, urban populations, seem to be um, much more strongly hit by the virus than other populations. Um, we also know the elderly, and in fact, there's many, much data suggesting that men are more susceptible to severe disease um, uh, than the rest of the population. So there are a lot of factors that are coming out from the uh, data these days uh, that merit more investigation. Uh, the U.S. just today is asking for additional demographic information on COVID-19 infected patients so they can really sort of target and understand um, the subpopulations that are being affected uh, by severe disease. So uh, there's still a lot to learn, but the data is coming in and uh, we're collecting the data in ways that are going to allow us to really identify these uh, high-risk populations and get at the reasons why they're at risk. Andrew, really quickly, is the second wave likely over the winter time? Is it, you know, seasonal? Yeah, so uh, it's looking more and more like, um, you know, there is some seasonality to this virus. Um, right now, we're going to continue to see cases. There's so many people that have no immunity to this virus that it's relatively easy for the virus to find people who it can infect right now. Um, once we move back inside, once humidity and temperature drops, um, we expect that there are going to be a surge of cases, very similar to what we saw in, perhaps in the 2009 H1N1 pandemic, where the mm -hmm. virus sort of simmered over the summer and then um, uh, caused a strong surge of cases um, in the fall. We hope to be much more prepared for that um, and be yeah. able to deal with that much more better.